All right, I think we're going to get started. So for those uh, that were here earlier today, I'm Mark Alenowitz, and I'm with Digital Offering. We are an investment bank that is modernizing the way capital formation is being utilized in today's evolving marketplace. And I'm going to talk a little bit about today the status of the current IPO market, what's happening, and really what we think is the future and how we're solving for it. And hopefully there are issuers in the audience here that would be interested in raising capital, either through a primary IPO or a secondary and a follow-on, or if any of my competition or frenemies, as somebody said earlier today, uh, competitive banks, we love to work with everyone. So we would welcome you to, to have a conversation with us and see how we can work together. So digital offering is a, a lead underwriter. We're very active in the marketplace. We just completed an offering last Friday. It was one of our smaller ones. It was 11.2 million. It was actually oversubscribed to 15 million. And we had the issuer actually reject uh, capital, which in this market it was against our better uh, advice. But either way, the stock is still up two or three days later. So it's going to give you an idea of what we do and how our systems work. We also have a sister company called Cambria Capital which is the digital side of our business. And we run a platform called My IPO, which allows investors to be able to come in and electronically subscribe to offerings and utilizing the modern techniques that I'm going to talk about here today. And that modern technique allows these investors to use regular cash and also credit cards. And what's excellent about the platform is at the end of the offering, they can trade directly out of it and buy other securities. So it's a true online brokerage firm that has integrated with modern capital formation techniques. So really what we're going to be talking about today is, is kind of what the new norm is. And, and the reality is it's the death of the small cap IPO. The last 18 months has been absolutely terrible. Anybody that's in this micro cap or small cap, and I think really what we're talking about today is nano cap, these stocks have been slaughtered. So IPOs, what used to be 15, 20, $30 million deals, are being repriced and they're coming out between four and six million. And they now no longer are just common stock, but they're unit offerings. And they're offerings that have structure and toxicity. And we're seeing units that are coming out with sometimes up to 200% warrant coverage or pre-funded warrants or some type of toxic convert or reset and rofers on these warrants. So if you take any money after your stock has already collapsed and then you take more money because you have to because you only raised four million in the IPO, you then give up your company because of the toxicity related to those warrants. And the other problem that we have is the syndicate players are becoming wise to what's going on. They'll participate in the offering, and then they're protecting their investors, and they immediately sell. So it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And one of the things that a lot of CEOs and a lot of the management teams don't understand is that they always say, why would anybody sell my stock when I just did the deal of $2 with the warrants? And they don't understand that the investors are going to sell the common stock because the five-year warrant you just granted them is worth a lot more than taking a half a point loss on the common. Because that's the first thing the CEOs say, they'll never sell because that's the floor, it's $2. And next thing you know, the stock's a dollar per share. So what we've been focusing on digital offering is something called Reg A. And Reg A got a bad name. And the reality is Reg A is amazing. What's wrong is small cap aftermarket and small cap underwriting. But if you think about it, securities in the US need to be registered or exempt. Securities that we think of a traditional IPO is an S1. Shares are registered with the SEC. You go out in a firm commitment offering. You'll get price discovery. The banker will always tell you that you're worth a lot more. And then they come after and back and almost bait and switch you after you've just spent nine months and all this money and say, well, the price discovery looks like it's no longer at $10 a share, it's now at $4 a share. And that $200 million market cap, you should just take $4 million now. But you're only going to be taking at this $30 million market cap so we can get you done. And that's something that all these companies are becoming victims of. And it's unfortunate because it's not because the banks are wanting to do this. But the reality is that it's become an investor-driven market rather than an issuer-driven market. So the terms and the valuations and the structure that used to be beneficial to issuers now have reversed and it's only beneficial to the investors. And that's unfortunate because if you think about all these great companies that are trying to raise capital, they're trying to create economic value for themselves and their shareholders 
and they're starting right at the beginning with no ability to be able to execute. So what we work on is utilizing modern techniques. So there's something called the JOBS Act. And the JOBS Act has three areas. Title II, which is general solicitation of private placements. Title III, which is crowdfunding, which is up to five million. And then there was something called Reg A. And Reg A gives us the ability to modernize the way we communicate with the street. And we're able to utilize modern techniques. And what I mean by that is in a regular IPO, you have a quiet period. Well, that doesn't work in a modern world where everybody's using social media and everybody's real instant gratification. So how can you operate a business where you can't say anything about your business? How do you go out and raise money on a road show when you can't leave materials behind? How do you do a conference or a webinar where it can't be pre-recorded for somebody to be able to come back and listen to it at another date? Reggae does away with all that. It is the exact opposite. It allows you to be loud and proud and communicate. And more importantly, in this day and age of where investors do their own due diligence and investors want to find out, you can actually do a road show by doing a video of walking through the plant, walking through the facility and looking at those widgets and allowing the investor to truly see what your business is about, not reading about it in a black and white prospectus that's going to tell you all the reasons why you're going to lose money, which is really important and should be disclosed right up front, but it's also going to give you a visual experience where you can see what it looks like real time. And the beauty of Reg A is you can view that on social media, on Instagram, on Facebook, on email blasts, and on Google ads. The other thing that we created, which we'll talk about, is the ability to do secondary offerings for companies that have been listed and have been decimated and seen their stock prices collapse. And there's an example of a company here that we're working on right now where the company had a $200 million market cap they raised a lot of money. Unfortunately, they took it from a very toxic lender, and their stock has a $3 million market cap today. If they take any money, they're going to dilute. Where we've created a structure where we do a non-traded convertible preferred that detaches from the common stock, and I'll talk about that, and we're going to raise $20 million for them. So we forget that the company exists as common. We focus on the preferred, allow the company to raise all the money that they need, execute their business, and suddenly the street's gonna wake up and say, this company's doing 30, 40, 50 million a year, and this has a $3 million market cap? That's a hell of a buy. And hopefully people start to recognize the value and the common, but in the meantime, they didn't lose their company and they're able to raise capital. And the other thing that we do is we do a non-traded common stock where we allow the company to raise money. We raised $18.5 million from 8,000 investors last September for one of our clients. And that enabled this company to execute on their business plan. We've now filed an IPO using this methodology that will do 20 million for them and we'll put them on NASDAQ. So this company will raise close to $40 million and doing it in a way that it's supposed to be. You raise money, you grow fundamentals, your business thrives, and you raise additional capital. So a little bit just on the background of Reg A, as I said, it was established back in 2015 uh, there's an attorney in the audience where he and I brainstormed these ideas. We did the first reg onto a national securities exchange. We actually did it onto the New York Stock Exchange, and it was innovative and creative, and no one listened to us. We went up and down the street. I talked to every broker dealer, every institution tried to get them in, and I basically had zero institutional support. The deal was supposed to be a $10 million deal. We closed it at $7.5 million. We were able to get it almost all from retail investors. Stock opened up, traded flat, nobody listened to us, and the next day the stock went to 21 and traded millions of shares in the 20s and everybody made money and that opened the reggae business. And after that, shortly after, we did another company called Fat Brands, which is Fat Burger, and as a matter of disclosure, I'm currently on their board. We four times oversubscribed that deal. The company has grown dramatically. It's an example of why reggae works. Customers and fans are now able to buy their stock. The company had about 300 million in top line sales. It's over 2 billion in top line sales today. So it demonstrates that the power of the crowd gives the capital for companies to be able to execute their business. So as I said, companies are, and the confusion around Reg A is it doesn't matter what type of registration. You can use Form 1A, which is the, it's a quasi registration. It's actually an exempt security but it enables the company to be able to raise capital and the shares are non-restricted. They're free trading, which means they can trade in the secondary market. In a traditional IPO, which is an S1 or an F1, 
for a foreign issuer, those shares get priced. So that we had to come up with a new idea because Reg A is only available to North American companies. But there are a lot of great companies around the world that are listed or that are, are, um, emanate from a different part of the world where they want to list on the New York or NASDAQ. And they want to be able to get generation, you know, interest from that business. But the problem is Americans really might not understand the business. So we created a methodology where we're able to utilize S1 for US issuers and F1 for foreign issuers where we deem it effective first, we price it, it's fixed price, and we go out and we mark it for 90 days. And it works. We just raised for a company called MDB Holdings in October a $20 million financing. So all of the transactions that we're doing are between 15 million and 25 million. And as I mentioned, they're between 3,000 and 10,000 investors. So this is the true definition of what a public offering is supposed to be. It's not 310 because shareholders because the CEO gave out shares to 10 of their buddies in order to get to the number that 300 to 310 to be able to list. So the beauty of using Reg A is it actually gives two bites of the apple because you're converting customers into shareholders and you're converting shareholders into customers. So the idea is that if you use the product, you eat at the restaurant, you utilize their services, why not own the stock? Why not get a chance to finally get what mainstream institutional investors get? Why not democratize and level the field and let everybody get the opportunity to participate in that offering? That's what Reg A does. And these shareholders, many people have never even bought the product. But now that you're a shareholder, you realize, well, wait a minute, this is a great widget. It's something I want to be a part of. And you can go out. So it creates additional visibility for the product, and hopefully, and ultimately, additional revenue and fundamentals that will cause the stock price to rise. As I mentioned, we also have this product that we utilize, which is called the Preferred. And this is something that we are getting a lot of interest in, because unfortunately, a lot of these issuers have become under this toxic structure. So there are plenty of companies that also have not taken toxic structure, but the market doesn't recognize the value of the stock. And most of the issuers that are here today probably feel that way. They feel that their company's worth a lot more than it's trading at, and they really don't want to dilute at these levels. And all the bankers and bank investors and everybody that's pitching them are saying, I'm happy to do a registered offering with you, but you just got to give me pre-funded warrants, 200% warrant coverage, and so on and so on. So what we created is the concept of a non-traded preferred. So the preferred itself is issued to the common, to all of the, as I mentioned, the followers, affinity groups, customers, everybody in the crowd can now participate. And they're investing $500 to $1,500 in the belief that this is not a stock flip, but they're truly passionate about the opportunity. And they're investing because they want to see the company successful, and they want to see the company be able to raise capital and execute on their business plan. So it's a great way. And then at the end of the offering period, and here's the best part, this is a continuous offering over a 12-month period. Now, Reg A allows you to raise up to 75 million in a lot of these Reg A conferences, and people say, oh, we're gonna raise 75 million, and they file, no one's raising 75 million, not in this market. But people are raising, as I mentioned, 15, 20, 25 million. We currently have three NASDAQ companies and one Toronto Stock Exchange company that we're doing this for. These are companies that are all worth a lot more than they're trading at, fundamentally, if you do comps and peers, but they're oversold. And by disconnecting from the common, they can finally not have to worry every day about what that common stock price is and how they're going to raise money. And because it's a continuous offering, every two to three weeks, we have a closing. So they're able to take that money, utilize it to continue to grow their business and not have to wait to the end of the offering period. And they're able then to use that money to buy more media ads, to continue to perpetuate the marketing campaign, to continue to raise more capital. So I'm trying to go fast here because we don't have a lot of time. But Really what it comes down to are, you know, what does Reg A offer? As I said, it gives you the ability to file a registration or a quasi-registration with the SEC. You can do full general solicitation. You can market to non-accredited investors across all 50 states without worrying, have to worry about what's called blue sky. And in the end, the methodology that we developed, and this is kind of our secret sauce, so we're not gonna give away too much of it, but we make it look, act, and feel, and most importantly, settle like a traditional IPO. So we close, and the stock gets, uh, we file what's called an 8A, it makes it come, become a 34-act company, and it opens for trading on NASDAQ the next morning. 
So there's no difference to all the players on Wall Street. It all settles through DTC. It all settles in what all of us are used to in a traditional IPO, except it gives the ability for the company also to have confidence that they can close because the crowd's money comes in in an escrow account. So over a period of time, we're able to see exactly how much money's there. So when we go out and close a deal, we already have it closed. We take it to NASDAQ and we say we have 7,000 investors. They're happy with it. The money's in the account. And then we allow the rest of the street to participate. DVP players, toxic financers, flippers, you're not getting an allocation. People get upset because we cut people back. But we do it because we want to maintain the integrity of the deal and have investors invest because they believe in the business, not because they're trying to get a stock flip. And that's what after that comes public. You have all your 34 Act reporting standards. Nothing's different. It was just a different form of registration. But the end result is you're listed on NASDAQ, you're listed on the NYSC, and you're listed as a public company. I'm going to fast forward a little bit here. But the, the process itself, and it's just like any other IPO, you go through the process with NASDAQ, you go through the process with FINRA, you go through the process with the SEC, and the end result. The broker-dealers, though, this is the hard part. Most broker-dealers are not, don't have the capability to handle thousands and thousands of investors. So you need to find a broker-dealer if you're an issuer that understands and has the technology to be able to bring on those investors and be able to manage that, go through the KYC, go through the ability to verify the investor, be able to take credit cards, be able to put all this together and work with transfer agents like Equity Stock Transfer and VStock and the other transfer agents that are pioneers in this industry and give that ability then to, on closing, have those securities be able to trade in the open marketplace. Because it's a, I gotta tell you, it's like herding cats when you have 7,000 investors and you're trying to close a deal. It's not like I said, with three or four institutions and 290 other investors that basically are coming from syndicate. So the cost of this is actually a little less than a regular IPO. So traditional lawyers that come to the table are reducing their prices to do the reg A's because it's not as much work, although our reg A filings are equivalent to an S1, so the disclosure standard is the same. We still require that the auditors provide comfort, we require legal opinions, we require everything in a firm commitment underwriting, but the other side of it is that even the underwriter's counsel fees are much less than in a traditional IPO. So you're able to get public for less money and you're able to be able to utilize this exemption to raise that capital. And once you're public, you can do everything like a regular deal. You can do follow-ons, you can do secondaries, we develop a product that we call a synthetic ATM. It's the closest thing to an ATM because for the first 12 months of a public company, you can't utilize uh, S3. So we've created instruments that mimic it, that allow these companies to be able to continue to raise capital without the toxicity and the ability to raise capital using just straight common stock like it's supposed to be. We're also finding that there are a lot of Reg A companies that have been doing, so at the beginning I said Reg A had a bad rap. And it had a bad rap because after the success of the Reg A's that we were doing, a lot of people jumped in the industry. And with Reg A comes great responsibility because it's, you have to, as a CEO, look in the mirror and be responsible to your investors just because no one is challenging on that $1 billion valuation when maybe you're worth $50 million, you need to be realistic in those expectations that you price your deal based on Paul and comps and peers. And having an investment banker there is important. When Reg A first started becoming popular, there were no bankers. They started doing these deals and started doing deals they shouldn't have been doing. It has nothing to do with the form of registration. You should not be raising money on companies that are not worth what they are because you have thousands of people who believe in it and drink the Kool-Aid when in reality, they're gonna be harmed in the end. But there are plenty of Reg A issuers that did private rounds like what we did with the 7,000, 8,000 investors for the 18 and a half million that now get the second bite. So we are currently working with several issuers that did previous Reg A's that are now ready to go and be able to be listed. And what we found when we do these deals is that those investors actually buy more because they gave the company money, the company executed, and they want to continue to support the company. So we did one called Nightscope, and we ended up having, I think, almost 28,000 investors were total in the capitalization and almost 80% of the previous investors came in 
and wanted to buy more or bought more in the aftermarket. So this gives you an idea of some of the companies that we've recently done. And the other thing that we're doing, and I think this is a really key point, is this not only works for NASDAQ and NYSE, but also works for OTC issuers. So we, in October, closed $10 million for Nevada Gold on the OTC markets. Now think about that, an OTC issuer raised from thousands of investors $10 million, and this is giving that company the ability to execute. Skycore is the company I mentioned that we raised the money for as a non-traded. company is coming public here shortly. Monogram, same serial issuer, where it was able to raise money. Nightscope was able to raise money. MDB is a private company, I'm sorry, a company that we used S1 and has been very successful in being able to raise that capital. So it works. And with that, I actually settled right on time. Happy to answer any questions. No questions. Well, if you are an issuer and you want to come public, please contact us. David. Hi, thanks. How do you market the non-traded Reg A offering, given that you know the whole benefit of liquidity isn't actually there? Well, that's a good point, because when I look at, in, in fact, David and I used to speak on a lot of panels together, and I used to always say that crowdfunding to me was nothing other than a charitable donation. You're going to drink the beer, eat the bread, and at some point you're going to want liquidity, and there's basically zero chance of going liquidity. The beauty of a non-traded Reg A and the non-traded Reg A's that we take on is that they're stepping stones to a public offering. So instead of doing a private placement where you can only work with accredited investors, and we on the previous panel talked about the difficulty of being able to prove accreditation, this is a great tool to be able to do, go to a non-accredited investor, in essence, to do a bridge round. So we actually market in the prospectus or in the offering circular that the intention is that at some point over the next couple of years is to graduate through a public offering to, prevail, to provide the liquidity for those investors to be able to get that exit. So, again, downside of Reg A is there's a lot of service providers out there that are providing Reg A's that are non-traded that basically will never get public. But the Reg A's that we try to work with are, like I said, stepping stones to a public offering without having to worry about the complexity of doing a private placement. And the blue sky filings of their private placement. The other downside, so we've been saying the positive, the negative of, of Reg A is that Investors can only invest 10% of their income or net worth. So there are limitations on how much they invest. But people always say, well, isn't that a problem? But the reality is people that we're talking about are buying 500, 1500, 2000. There's certainly investors that are accredited that come in for larger positions. But what you're talking about is thousands of investors that add up to millions of dollars at 500 to $1,500 a time. I have a question. Um so have you had any or experienced any friction of the SEC approving Reg A's, um, especially in um, spaces like crypto? Well, definitely in crypto. Um, <laughs> but I think that has nothing to do with Reg A. I think that has to do with just the whole mindset of the SEC related to crypto and crypto regulations. But when a Reg A is filed with an investment banker and a reputable law firm and a disclosure document that mimics an S1, we found that our Reg A's are going through reviews relatively quickly. And they're similar in nature. I mean, one of the things that people say is Reg A, no one takes it seriously at the SEC and they just bless these deals and go through. That's not true. It's a full registration, it's a full review, and when you file for NASDAQ, it's the same thing. So the protections are there for investors from a disclosure standpoint. And if you have an accurately um, authored document, you're gonna get through. If you come in with a crap document, you're gonna get commented, and if you come in with a crypto, you'll probably never get through. And uh, Harvey had asked a question. I was asking about the social media following. Do you expect the companies to come with their own social media following, or are you building it in connection with the offering? No, so the key, and what we try to focus on, are ideas and stories that people can understand in 30 seconds or less. If you're coming within a complex biotech where that glass of water is gonna solve cancer and do this, but it takes you 45 minutes to get through the science, you've already lost them. So anything with a large customer base, affinity group, consumers, followers, anything with that type of presence is ideal for Reg A. Reg A, though, to work requires a marketing budget. It requires an agency to come in and help craft a story, create a video, and be able to present that story 
on Instagram and other types of social media feeds where it gets the attention of the investor that they see it, they click on it, and then they get the full disclosure related to the offering. They see the risks, they see the benefits, and they can make an informed decision. But you have to have the teaser that gets their attention to click. Because if you don't click, you're never going to get the opportunity to be able to sell that security to the investor. Yes, sir, Gene. Let's say a company wants to do a Reg A, and they come to you and they say, hi, Mark, hi Mark we're thinking about this. What, how much money should they have set aside from, hi, Mark, nice to meet you, to we're now listed on NASDAQ? What would the costs be? And, so, I, and I know some of that money can come out of the money that's raised, right? Yeah, so the, the total offering size um, of capital that you're going to need it really breaks down just like any other underwriting. You're gonna have two attorneys at the table. You're gonna have issuers counsel and underwriters counsel. Underwriters counsel is about 100,000. Issuers counsel, there are service providers that do it for 75,000. There are service providers that do it for 300,000. It's gonna be the quality of your attorney and the size of the deal. The auditing fees, it's important that you have to have two years of audits just like any other IPO. Those range anywhere from 150 to 300,000 or more depending on the size. I can't say the name of the company here today. I'm very excited in a couple weeks I will be, but we're doing right now a $225 million raise. We think we'll sell it out in a very short period of time. And we're following it up with a $75 million Reg A. And it's gonna be marketed. So it's a total of a $300 million raise. It's gonna modernize the way we do these things. That particular company, it's gonna cost several million dollars to come public because it's a sizable company, sizable revenue, and the audit itself will probably be three quarters of a million to a million dollars. The other fees that you have are just typical NASDAQ filing fees. You have transfer agent fees. You have Edgar filing fees. You have DTC eligibility fees. But these are all fees associated with it. The real question is how much is it going to cost in marketing? And the way it works is this. It's basically a one to five to one to nine ratio, meaning for every dollar you put up, you'll raise five. In a really exciting company, you'll raise nine. And in the continuous offering, you can basically seed that with a couple hundred thousand dollars and be able to pull the money out as you go. In a regular offering, unfortunately, you have to wait till the closing to be able to get your money out. So again, if you're interested in either primary or you're already listed and you want to do a secondary, feel free to reach out to us. We'd love to talk to you. Appreciate your time today. Thank you.